Bear Walker, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Really an honor to be on with you, sir. Oh, uh, thank you. That's that's quite flattering coming from you. I uh, have been aware of your uh, works for quite some time now. Uh, you are a spiritualist. Uh, you were raised in the traditional Native American way. However, you found your way into traditional medical science as well. Tell me about the early years. It was your granddad that had the most influence on you, uh, wasn't it? You know, that's 100% true. I grew up literally on a uh, reservation, um, both between um, the way upper peninsula of Michigan and Canada, which was pretty much open at that time, especially if you were, I was of the Anishinaabe tribe and still of, of the Anishinaabe tribe. And so we traveled uh, extensively um, um, in, in between different uh, areas of the reservation, mostly uh, in, a, in a heavily, heavily forested uh, area. I grew up in a land without fences. I grew up in a literally in the middle of a, of a, of a, of a huge forest uh, with uh, an amazing community of, of people that were um, very much connected to the land and connected to what we would call the you know the old ways or the native ways. So it was it was really quite a uh, you know, wonderful way to to be raised. Now, your granddad worked very, very hard to make sure, and this is this is something in and of itself worth talking about. It's sure. something that we have have we abandoned in, in modern Western culture. Um, most children don't know their grandparents, couldn't name their great grandfather. <laughs> uh, never mind any of their heritage. But your granddad worked very, very hard to pass on to you uh, your heritage, even though. This was not probably very popular for you growing up as a child because most families wanted their children to assimilate, become like everyone else, so to speak. Uh, it, it's a good point. I come back, I come from seven generations of the Bear Clan, so um, I know seven generations back and have in my possession um, different things, sacred bones, different things that come from seven generations in my family. And so it was an honor. One of the first medicines <coughs> that were taught is the what we call respect um, and or the concept also of miigwech, which means thank you or thankfulness for our generation. So we always walk proud because we're carriers of, of our seven generations. We believe every step that's brought us to this place has been carried by our seven generations before us. So we always walk in honor of those seven generations, and we walk in respect to the seven generations who are coming after us. And, well, my children also are Native and been raised Native, and been raised in the ways of our way, like, for instance, we were, my children have never, ever had a vaccination. My children have never had an antibiotic. I birthed all my children in the home natural way, and they've been raised knowing the ways of, of the Native people. So, But your point is valid specific to the degradation of the tribe, and I started to see that in my early teenage years, 18, 17, 18, and I was very rebellious. I actually got kicked out of school like 30 or 40 times because I was terrible uh, as far as what was going on in school and things and, and never thought I'd even graduate. But I saw what they brought to the, the reservation where they brought them food, and they would bring in literally 50-pound uh, 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 bags of white flour and white rice and all the cheese and all these things, and you could see literally – the people becoming fatter and heavier and sicker, and diabetes became a plague uh, on, on the reservation, and uh, alcoholism and depression, et cetera, et cetera, when they imported the, the white people's, you know, diet. So I actually was one of the people who, who saw that happen, and, um, you know, my grandfather stayed close to me and kept telling me in my head never to eat that way or whatever. We grew up eating basically what we could forage, which um, some people would consider – Poor, but we hunted, fished, and we ate wild rice when we could gather it, and we ate squash and beans and corn that we, we grew. So it was a whole different way. Um, and, and frankly, if you've ever been in the deep in the forest, you can't grow a, as much rice or you can't gather as much wild rice in the, in the lakes uh, to, to have it be a huge part of your diet. Carbohydrates were, or rice was only used small little bit or squash or whatever, the biggest part of our diet would have been mostly venison. I grew up eating a lot of venison, but I've eaten everything from squirrel to porcupine to bear to you name it, other than I've never I've, eaten I've, I've, I've eaten bear. Um, I, I uh, have the privilege of being able to say that I have taken two black bear in the Adirondack region uh, right outside of uh, 
Locke Muller in the uh, Adirondack region of wait, New York. Wait, wait, do you remember the names? They could have been cousins. See, this could be a problem, Carl. Why? I have family in the Adirondacks. Those could have been cousins of mine. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I guess, but you know what? You know, you know what? Here's something funny. I, <laughs> I, hunt, I hunted with a guy who was half Native American. Oh, yeah, yeah, And yeah. one of the things he taught me, and I, and I used to feel odd about this, but I did it anyway, and then it became very, very common for me. But we made medicine over animals after we killed them. We would stand there and we would say, you were a good animal, you had a great life, you contributed, oh. and now we're going to, we're, your, your flesh is going to contribute to our life. That's exactly, he, t- he really taught you the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so when, but, but, but you know what, I have the pleasure of being able to say that I've eaten bear, and, and, the, and <laughs> the Native Americans believed that the bear was actually a human being, and anybody who's ever totally. skinned a bear knows why, because it looks just like a human being once it has its fur off. Well, you know your stuff. That's impressive. A lot of people don't don't have any idea of this, and 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 they, you know, one of the things that's a real misnomer is that they think that you know, based on maybe Judeo-Christian values, that we were all like wild and heathen. But we had a very solid, very respectful way of life, and we had a lot of respect for the circle of life, or the what we call the medicine wheel. Uh, which is an integral part of everything we do, including how we ate. And the other thing was no waste. You never wasted anything. Right. When we right. took a deer, first of all, there's thankfulness and respect to the deer, but then there's also every part of that was do you be used properly, be it the, 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 the ligaments and tendons, the sinew we use for, for, for um, binding things, um, of course the skin, every pound of the food was eaten, Every bone was used uh, as a part of what we did, so there wasn't waste and there was, you know, respect. It was a whole, it was just a very different... Um... In fact, in fact, a little bit of trivia, and then we'll get right back on track. I love this. The term chew the fat came from Native yeah. Americans who, when they would, they, 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 one of the processes of tanning yeah. was uh, the, the, the women actually chewed the skin to break it down so that it would be more supple and smooth for the, the for the for the skins that were going to use they were going to use on ba- with babies absolutely and true. so the term chewing the fat came I, from they would sit around in circles the women and they would chew these leather pieces until they were soft and supple no uh, that is so absolutely true and here's the other thing you're talking about fat see fat was a prize to us especially you know we've got in in bitter cold weather i live now in up uh, just outside of manhattan in new york to me, this is tropical compared to where I grew up. We had winters <laughs> basically from September to May. And so fat was extremely important. You talk about a bear, too. See, a bear has a nice lining of fat, and that was prized. It was kind of, it would be cooked in a certain way, and it was used just to prepare foods and things like that. So uh, uh, the whole American concept of no fat or low fat or whatever it, it doesn't. It, it didn't work. I mean, it wasn't for us. That wasn't our way of thinking. Well, and, and, let, and before we, we're going to go a little long on this segment because I want to also make make <laughs> one very important point. Right now, there is a, a movement afoot in the United States and and around the world to return to more ancestrally based uh, ancient diets because yeah. we now understand that the modern Western diet is exactly the reason for chronic disease, and no one, no group of people displays this fact better than Native Americans who, through uh, thousands of years of uh, uh, genetic reformation, became some of the most efficient, physically most efficient running bodies in the world. They could live during periods of famine, yep. and, they could, and they could thrive on very, very low uh, intake of foods for long periods of time. This was uh, part of the evolutionary selection pressure that that actually made this group of people stronger. Hence, when you turn them over to the Western diet, which is high in grains, high in corn, high in flours, high in starches, high in sugars, and low in fat and low in protein, these poor people become com- severely obese and ill. Absolutely, 100% true. And so now, in summary, the, the Americans believe that uh, the, um, the Native Americans survived on corn. That's not true, is it? No, no, that's so not true. We, we, we only grew a small amount of corn for certain ceremonial things, and then we ate a, a, a very small amount. You can't grow that much corn. We didn't have a long enough season or whatever, but it wasn't an integral part of our diet. We, our diet, especially where I come from, would be more wild rice. We would take, um, there were fields of 
wild rice, which is very different than the rice. Yes, uh, wild, wild most rice. Americans is, wild it's, rice it's, is actually a form of grass. That's correct. It is a form of grass, and we and it was it's actually substantially higher in protein and substantially higher in fiber and also in the B vitamins than, than even a good brown rice. But so so at a certain season, you could drive, you could slide your canoe through a lake and shake the wild rice into your canoe. And, and but see, all of those were minimal compared to hunting, fishing, and you know, sophisticated yes. crafting. That yes. was, uh, you know, that was uh, uh, very much a, a part of that. And you know, I'm not of the clan that did most of the hunting. I'm of the bear clan, which were people who did the medicine. But the the, the hunting clans that did this were expert in it, and they were phenomenal. And 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 they were uh, highly. Uh, it's hard to explain it. it. There was sophistication, and there was a whole circle to it that was that's never been you know uh completely understood well well, here's what i want to do i have to take a commercial break when we come back i want to start to bridge what you learned as a young boy from a medicine man your granddad and then move forward into the application of science today in medicine And i also have to attribute my knowledge that wild rice is actually a grass to to my co-host on Friday's show, Elisa Profumo. She's the one who taught me that because I've avoided all rices. And she says, you know what? Wild rice is not rice. It's actually like a grass seed. I said, really? Really? Yeah, no, she's she's great job to her, and and that's kind of you to credit her. But that's, yeah, that's 100% true, and therefore it functions in the body substantially different, you know? Okay, let's take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to pick it up with Bear Walker. You're listening to Super Human Radio. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's Superhuman Radio. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. We're talking this hour with Bear Walker. Trained as a traditional medicine man, as a young man, finds his way into the science of medicine. So, Bear, explain, um, obviously... This love of medicine uh, and the learning of medicine has to be something that has been instilled in you, not just what your grandfather taught you, but he obviously kind of taught you to love this process as well. Well, yeah, there is no doubt. He was uh, an amazing and incredibly kind. uh, And although from the standpoint of education, almost no education, as a young man he was actually captured by the Catholic tribe and he was taken to uh, learn in a, a school, but they cut all his hair off and they beat him if he spoke Anishinaabe. So he ran away, and he ran over 200 miles um, back to his reservation, and he never, he never went back to school. So he was never trained like in regular school, but in many ways, as my education went on further and further, I actually realized that the things that he knew specifically of how a cell functions Without ever having any training in, in cellular biology, it was was really quite uh, quite amazing. So anyway, around the age of seventeen, eighteen, I was actually in a lot of trouble. I was uh, pretty rebellious. I was not happy with things at the reservation, and I certainly was doing terrible in school. And a very fine teacher, who I always appreciate, took some real special time with me, Mrs. Winslow, and she said, "Listen, if you'll." pay attention, you could go on to college, and I said, I don't think so, I'm going to be, you know, constantly in the forest, I don't want to go, but I could see things were changing, you know, very much on reservation, and it was becoming more, uh, there was a lot of fighting, it was the beginning of the AIM movement, um, and there was also a lot of just trouble, uh, sickness and illness on reservation, so anyway, I went off to school, I did my undergraduate and studies in naturopathic medicine, um, I, from Canada up in Toronto, and then I went on, I did a residency in, in, um, clinical ecology at University of Pittsburgh, and from there we did projects uh, specific on um, on electrodermal and on spe- very specialized um, types of computers. Um, we worked with astronauts. I worked with over 400 astronauts at NASA, at NIH, Walter Reed Hospital, so I did a lot of projects um, with establishing, um, from a quantum physics sort of a standpoint, um, cellular function, 30 different systems of the body. We were doing different functions. We were looking for ways to help them be at the very, very highest. If you take, if you take 400 astronauts and you do blood tests, they're almost all perfect because blood tests don't tell us nearly enough about the body. Right. So we developed other 
very sophisticated systems to be able to evaluate what else was going on in their bodies, and we did function tests. We could do challenge tests where we could t challenge a system and see if it works better. And then after I finished that project, I've been in private practice for about 20 years, um, you know, mostly affiliated either at, loosely at Columbia Presbyterian where I've done a number of programs for them or then my own specific clinics. And then I've done extensive work with um, high-end uh, professional athletes. Um, I've worked with some of the Dallas Cowboys, some of the New York Giants, the Jets. Well, you've Bengals. actually worked on, you've worked with a guest who's been on this show, uh, Eric Fiorello, who is a strong man who's going, uh, uh, abroad to lift the, what is it, the Hasenfeld stone or the Huschenfeld stone? Stone of, of, of Iceland. He's going to pick it Iceland. up and walk around the goat pen. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and hopefully, and hopefully know, and not, he is not, absolutely going to do it. We're a hundred percent pulling. I've been working with him as a patient for the last three months and he's absolutely inspirational. And he's an incredible guy, and he is such a fan of, of, of yours too, Carl. But um, he is, uh, you know, I call him Super Eric. I never even call him Eric, but, but he, um, he's going to do it. And so we're building him up. Um, we're doing, I've done a number of tests with him to find out where he, he has faults, where he has, uh, you know, some deficiency. And if you look at this guy, he's a powerhouse. So I, it works, you have to work really hard to find little areas where he could still do better and better. So um, um, he's also a huge fan of, of, cor of course, John Woods. And, and right. John Woods, who runs Cell Wellness, that's another superhuman guy. That guy goes like nobody I've ever seen. He has, I don't know, maybe he's 56 or 57 years old. He tests like he's 35 on my system, my computer, and he's just amazing. So, but he's been on a paleo diet. He does grass-fed beef. Well, let, let's, 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 let's uh, back up just for a second and give John... Uh, a little bit more of, of attention here. John Wood, uh, for those of you who do know or don't know, is the founder uh, behind U.S. Wellness Meats, the premier right. international source, I'm sorry, na national source for grass-fed beef, humanely raised swine, chickens that have real lives that eat worms and, and live normal lives. He has every type of product you can imagine for anybody who is a devotee of eating animal protein from animals that live natural lives the way nature intended them to, eating grass, no hormones, no antibiotics, no human intervention. These are just animals in the wild. John uh, started U.S. Cell Wellness because he felt that there was an area within the supplement industry that was being neglected. And the, the, I learned about you through John because you actually use a lot of his supplements in your clinical setting, correct? That's correct. I have uh, five offices in the New York area, New York and Connecticut area, where we use um, with my patient base there um, a number of the, the U.S., um, uh, well, of course, U.S. wellness meats, but also the cell wellness uh, products. We use, um, I, I, I probably have um, a few thousand patients who use uh, a, a number of the different products, everything from uh, I mean, I could go over them one by one, but I mean, they're 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 incredible. What they what, do you, do. what do you think? What do you think the most valuable product that that the one the first t top two most valuable products that he provides that you use that you see the greatest results in the largest uh, group of people? Two very different types of things. Number one, you're going to find that almost everyone in the U.S., almost everybody who uh, an Amer American is um, is toxic based on either what they've breathed in, what they've lived, the mercury fillings, or have had a number of different exposures. And so because of that, the number one thing I would say is humic acid because the humic acid reduces your toxic load, whether it be mercury, whether it be, you know, people who ingest, uh, for instance, artificial sweeteners. But one of the number one, and it's one of the biggest degradations to the body. I was actually at the NIH when there was a vote or whether they should even legalize. And there was piles. Carl, there, were, there was piles of documentation brought in that it's going to increase brain cancer, it's going to increase breast cancer, et cetera, et cetera. It's tremendously carcinogenic. If you break an artificial sweetener down, it's methyl alcohol and formic acid. Those are deadly in combination. People just are, are full of this stuff. And so the humic acid is phenomenal for flushing that out. By the way, if, if, if we have listeners who like to learn Read the book, The Hundred Year Lie, because The Hundred Year Lie will take, uh, it will show you how the chemical industry has grossly, grossly affected our population. And, and, and it's just, you know, it's just unbelievable. So humic acid, because it flushes the toxins out, very simple, very safe. Does humic acid, acid work uh, on the liver to flush toxins out? How does it work? 
It actually works at a cellular level. The liver, obviously, you, you know your stuff. The liver is a, a fairly substantial filtering system to the body. There, but you have a brand new liver every six weeks. The liver is in a constant process of regeneration. The problem where the liver, with, with the liver, because it filters blood, it filters the, the, the lymphatic fluids of the body, all of that runs through the liver, that it pulls the toxins out of blood or out of lymphatic fluids and things like that. So the liver itself, the filter itself becomes quite, quite toxic. But again, you have a brand new liver every six weeks and it's one of the fastest regenerating parts of your body. However, if you don't do something to help the liver, the liver is trying to create a, a new cell from a dirty cell. So two dirty, uh, a dirty cell creates two more dirty cells, so to speak, toxic right, cells. Right. But if you give humic acid, it flushes the toxins out of the liver. Therefore, the liver can create healthy cells. Uh, uh, it starts with one or two, but then it starts to clean out one after that. And within six weeks, within maybe if you have to do it twice, you're going to have a completely, completely clean liver. Okay. Um, what is the other product that you feel? The other one would be... The number one deficiency in the U.S. I know what you're going to say already because we just Elysium. talked about it yesterday. I knew you knew it too because you've well, already. Well, I'm, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess, and then you tell me if I'm wrong. All right. Magnesium. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> Bingo. I, I've I've discovered it myself. I mean, it's, we just did a whole show yesterday about magnesium, calcium, potassium, and sodium. Very, very unsexy topic, but no. one that's really in dire huge. need of examination. Huge, huge, huge. I was involved in a project at the Hale Clinic which is the largest integrated clinic in the world. It's in London, started by Prince Charles. And we did a study. We did the first 100 different diabetic patients, and we did 200, and they ended up doing, I think, a, a total of another 200, so maybe 500 in total. Of those 500 diabetic patients, every one, every one was magnesium deficient. Not 90%, not 80%, 100% were magnesium deficient. Yeah. We have an absolute... I mean, it's a, a, an epidemic of diabetes. We okay. have diabetic we, we children, have, not we have type 2. We, not have, type we, have, to, we have to take a break. Okay. Oh, I'll just, I'll no, 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 no. I, I, want, I want you to hold, because when we come back, I want to come back and I want to talk about magnesium and diabetes for a minute, just a you little bit it. further, because I have a question that I ask everybody about this. I'm trying to ascertain the answer. We, we understand the, you know, to come full circle, since we were talking about Native Americans, the Pima Indians, which are in Arizona, are, yeah. are genetically uh, insulin resistant because they evolved under conditions uh, where they were not assaulted with uh, high glycemic index carbohydrates for thousands of years, and now that they eat this stuff, they're, they're insulin resistant. Insulin resistance is actually a form of, uh, of, of uh, what's the word I want to use, advanced physiological state when you really think about us as animals being in the wild. So with that being the case, their insulin resistance is actually completely ameliorated when they are supplemented with magnesium. I can 100% agree. All right, let's just take this quick commercial break. When we come back, I want to talk more about, I'm curious about therapeutic doses of magnesium for how long before cellular magnesium elevates. We're talking with Bear Walker. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We're talking with Bear Walker, and uh, we're going to talk now a little bit further about uh, the relationship of magnesium deficiencies and diabetes. Bear uh, blood levels of magnesium do not represent cellular levels of magnesium, correct? 100% correct. The closest you get is what's called an RBC magnesium level, and the RBC magnesium level is a little more accurate. That's red only... blood cell because the red blood cell is more indicative of what's going on cellularly correct. in the body. So okay. if you want to do a clinical based on that, that's your better application. However, even those reference ranges are substantially less. Again, having worked with a number of pro athletes, and it would be inappropriate for me to mention their names because it would be then an endorsement. But I can tell you I've worked with the tops of the top. We were doing as high as 3,600 milligrams of magnesium daily, and we were still getting nothing but incredible positive charges. I worked with one of the top bicycle guys in the world for two years. His recovery rate when we went to over 3,600 milligrams of magnesium went from you know being able to train on Monday and Thursday to be able to train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So, so I mean, I know uh, from, from the standpoint of professional athletes, but from the standpoint of a cellular function, um, you know, make it cell, cell physiology simple or cell biology simple. There, there is nothing that you're going to be able to do within the mitochondria. You cannot increase mitochondrial function without magnesium. Besides that, magnesium also is one of the key things for the C amp and G amp cell to cell communicators. So based on, as you call it, insulin resistant, insulin resistant, um, <clears throat> diabetes is just that their, their cells literally cannot pick it up. The quantum coherence based on the cell, um, the cell communicators 
will not pass through the, the you know the cell membrane just because of extreme extreme magnesium deficiency. So magnesium deficiency, magnesium which is extremely positively charged, probably the most positively charged ion in your body, literally carries things through the cell wall so it can then be uptaked in the mitochondria to produce a higher level of ATP. Okay, okay. So here's here's the question. Um, what would you consider a therapeutic dose for a non-athlete, and how long would they have to take it, in your professional opinion, before the cells would be topped off? Okay, I'm going to do it in two ways. Number one, I'm going to say if you use the product from Cell Wellness, which is called Trace Minerals, and the reason I like it is because liquid uh, uptake is substantially better than virtually any of the other tablet or capsule types. You're, you're going to get, um, if you'll do 20 drops of the trace minerals two times a day, your actual, in, uh, actual um, uptake of magnesium is about 1,200 milligrams of, 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 of cellular uptake magnesium. If you're not going to take the trace minerals, you need anywhere from 12 to probably 1,800 milligrams of magnesium. The old 2 to 1 ratio, calcium to magnesium, is sort of out of date. Because Yeah, I know. See, that's funny because Dr. Michael Smith said the same thing yesterday from Life Extension Foundation, that they've discovered that after doing cursory reviews of all the available research, there yep. does not to, seem to be a ratio required for calcium and magnesium. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I found that to be 100% clinically, uh, you know, in, 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 and I've gone as much as three times uh, and, and much magnesium. See, I use a specialized computer testing device so I can actually evaluate where we're at, and then I also track people for 30 days to see what their, their improvements are. So, I, you know, I can do, you know, clinical that way, but if you have over 300 enzymes and cofactors in your body, every one of those have a magnesium molecule somewhere in their structure. Do you so, do you do you think that there is any preferential form of magnesium? I take 600 milligrams of magnesium glycinate right before bed to uh, number one uh, act as a mild ACE inhibitor and blunt the insulogenic response of sleep. But number two, uh, because it helps me sleep. However, I've learned from Dr. Smith that that may not be the best form of magnesium for some of the bone mineral. Uh, he, he feels that magnesium citrate is a better alternative uh, for the bone mineral uptake of, of fractional I actually magnesium. lean towards magnesium citrate myself. However, that said, let me just tell you, based on some of the original wonderful people, whether it be Carlton Fredericks or Linus Pauling, they wrote a number of books on what's called biochemical individuality, which means, Carl, there is nobody in the world like you. And so what works for you may be, a hundred percent what it what you know what's the best for you the one thing that people need to do is stop listening to their doctors and start listening to what their body's telling them and become tuned in to certain symptoms within their body and and that's a much better way i mean it's time to become proactive with your health learn programs like this so there's a ton of good books out there and start to become proactive with your health yourself because there's nobody in the world that's like you i can tell you and and so I can give you good advice for what might fit 80% of people, but realistically, you're completely different. So if you like the glycinates or even, you know, sometimes even people use a magnesium oxide, it's fine if it works for you. Um, but if you're still getting muscle crampings, if you're getting muscle fatigue, if you're getting, you know, if you're getting any of those types of symptoms that are magnesium deficiency, then you're still not taking, you know, the, the, the right amount. So, I again, you asked for two top products, humic acid, for sure for detoxing, trace minerals from the standpoint of bringing up the, the, the magnesium and the potassium and all the other 72 trace minerals of which, you know, you're talking about how we were as native people. One of the things as native people, we literally ate of the earth because the soil was more powerful. And the things that grew in our soil, be it squash, corn, or even the rice, or even the deer we ate, were higher levels of the trace minerals. And there's 72 other minerals Besides the ones that we know the most, magnesium, potassium, zinc, et cetera, et cetera, that are absolutely imperative for you to have, you know, high optimum levels of health. So the thing I like about the trace minerals is you do get your potassium, magnesium, and the common known uh, um, minerals, but you also get the 72 trace minerals that are harder to get, you know, a, a across the board. So it's, it's the closest thing to the earth type of a nutrient. It comes from a rare earth type of a combination that they're made from, so that, that they really they work phenomenal for you. Last question before we go into this break, and then when we come back, I want to talk about the machine that you use that tests uh, how many thousand, 13,000 different points inside the body or something like that? Um, there's 30 different key points, and then there's 30,000 bits of and information. And I, I want to understand what those, and, and the eight, uh, the eight uh, physical uh, body functions, I, I think I read in, in some of your literature also. But we'll get one question I have for you. 
in summing up this uh, mineral deficiency, which I really am a big proponent of educating my audience about mineral intake to, so stave, to stave off disease, um, do you think hair analysis provides uh, an all-around better alternative to determining uh, if cellular levels of, of uh, magnesium and other trace minerals are being reached? I'm actually I'm a big advocate of hair analysis. Unfortunately, in the Northeast, it's outlawed in a lot of our states. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why is that? Oh, no, you can't do uh, you. You'd have to have it sent to a different state. They just have decided that it's... Uh, it's a fallacy. Uh, it, it's it, it, that would that would be another whole program to uh, to go over. Um, <laughs> you know, I wonder if the, they were. I wonder if they were worried about uh, insurance companies uh, following behind you after you left the barber shop to try to find out if you were sick or not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that makes no sense. Hair analysis is used for drug uh, detection as well. Oh yeah, no, and they're and they're, 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 it's not that they're contending they're not accurate. They're just. You know, the, the, there's a number of challenges with it. I mean, if you want the medical kind of a model for it, none of which make make good sense, but they have their reasons, you know, for for uh, for outlawing them. But I'm a, I'm an advocate of those. I'm an advocate of anything that'll give you a broader base diagnostic markers on your body. Yeah. All right. Let's do this. Let's take a quick commercial break. When we come back, I want to talk about the machine that you use and also the systems that you look at. We're talking with Bear Walker. Welcome back to Superhuman Radio. We're talking with Bear Walker, part medicine man, part modern scientist. I think they ought to do a reality TV show about you, Bear. <laughs> I really do. You know, you bring. It's amazing when when you bring uh, two different philosophies together, you get uh, something better than just the addition of the two together. Quite often. Yeah, you're very kind. I I so appreciate it, and uh, I can tell you, I'm impressed with the work you've done. It's amazing, and it's so wonderful to have someone that's out there, you know, getting getting your message out and and getting uh, and helping us with what we're doing with, um, you know, uh, as as uh, this, uh, you know, as as uh, people who uh, who are like minded as you. So it's it's really an honor to be uh, working with you, my friend. Thank you, thank you. You talk about in some of your writings, you talk about the uh, eight. Um, I forget what it was called, the eight areas or the eight physical... Eight, eight systems of your body. Yes, and, yes, yes. And one of the real faults with medicine is the fact that it's become incredibly and incredibly specialized. You see a cardiologist for your heart. You see an endocrinologist for your endocrine system. You see a GI guy for your digestive, but none of them know how the systems work together. And, and, and that has become a tremendous... Uh, makes medicine very, very inefficient the way it is, and it, it, it certainly doesn't serve our people well, but... Okay, so raised native, we have what's called the eight sacred stones, and the eight sacred stones are a key part of our being uh, raised. But within your body, you have eight systems of the body, which starts with the cellular system, the neurological system, the endocrine system, the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, immune system, structural system, and I might have missed one. Oh, excretory system. So, so within those eight systems, it's the function of how those eight systems work hand in hand that really make for a healthy body. So if you go to a cardiologist and he says, well, your heart's fine, and by the way, I checked your cholesterol and it's good, you know, or whatever, and you die of a heart attack the next week, it's not because, the, it's just because of the endocrinologist, I mean, excuse me, the cardiologist did not look deep enough. And there's a number of other things that, that are functioning within that, including the relationship between your endocrine system, i.e. your adrenals particularly, and your heart. And so those are, those are often misunderstood. And so within the computer system I work with, It'll test the eight different systems, and it'll test a total of 30 different uh, parts of your body, your lymphatics, your lungs, your large intestine, ICV. You know, there's 30 different systems. I won't bore you, know, you with that. If anybody's interested, I'll be glad to post that on, um, you know, I'll get someone to post it on an email or something like that. Right. But anyway, so, so then what we're trying to do is we're trying to get all those systems to work in optimum at, at 100%. And that's that's what I do clinically. So the computer was designed. It actually originated from some of the work done in Germany, Dr. Vol, uh, which started some of the original elect what's called electrodermal and measures. I measure a GSR galvanic skin resistance point at peripheral nerve endpoints, and by doing that, I can tell what 30 different systems your body are doing, and they have an optimum reading. It's an ohm meter built into a computer system. Um, that evaluates, you know, evaluates your, the body. So that's what I've used for the last 25 years. I have uh, other connections where I can do subtle energy markers as well, 
Um, and then we use a thing called an omega wave with our athletes, which gives us VO2, VVO2. It gives us heart rate variability markers. This is invented in Finland. It's one of the top uh, computers used with uh, pro athletes. Um, and then we challenge them in a certain way to see where their breakdown point is for their lungs, as an example, or whatever. And then we also look at rehab or recovery systems, how, about, how well their body recovers. So this, the Omega Wave is used with, with the top, top, top pro athletes. So now specific to that, if people are interested, I have, uh, I'm the chief science officer for a company called Peak Performance Research and Development Institute, or if you want to look it up on the Internet, it's called PPRDI.com, I believe. The CEO, that's Jim Gersey, a good friend and partner of mine. And we do evaluations and we do systems analysis for, like I said, everything from pro teams to, you know, professional individuals. Um, and and um, that's, uh, that's the particular company I do most of that, that work for. Um, you know, I was, talking about the, uh, I was talking about the humic acid too, Carl, if you right. don't mind. There's actually a documentary, a television documentary they did called The Incurables. So you can do a Google search on Incurables. It'll deal, it deals with a fireman who they gave up to die. He was in a wheelchair, and they said, listen, you, you know, you basically have an incurable disease. It's called IBM, and you're only going to live another three or four months, and there's no hope. So we started him on a protocol where we did the humic acid, the trace minerals, and you know, I did a number of other things for him, and he came back 100%. In fact, he's playing golf and running around and still doing very well to this day. So they did a documentary, a television documentary on him called The Incurables, and people can, can look that up. I, I'm... Uh, it's on the internet or it runs on TV, you know, sometimes. So, you know, those are, those are available, um, you know, and, and I actually can do most of the testing and things through a DNA swab. So if anybody ever wants to, you know, connect with me on a, a DNA swab, I can, the office number for my Connecticut office, you would speak to a dear, dear friend of mine, Deanna Kinch, and her number is 860-384-1527. And, and if you call her, she'll give you, uh, all the information, what you need to do to send me a sample. Uh, you know, Carl, my, my gift to you, if you send me a sample, I'll be glad to run a test on you and show you 100% of what's going on for you. Maybe I should have done this on the air, but, but I'd be, it'd be no, an honor. No, I would love to. I would love to. Test, uh, and, and uh, you know, off the air, I'll be glad to give you all the, all the information. I'll tell you all your strong points, but I bet you I can find some weak point on you still, and we can see if we can't help you out a little bit more. No, I, I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for any type of testing that will... Uh, help elucidate, uh, you know, uh, things that I can do to stay healthier uh, and uh, be stronger and so on and so forth. So I would absolutely be willing to do that. Well, my gift to you, because I so much believe in what you're doing, and, um, you know, again, I'll do all this off the air. I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have even No, that. no, that's quite all right. No, no, I'm, I'm, that's, it's all good. I, I, I'm happy to do it. Let me it's ask great you. to work with. Some people would be kind of offended I even, you know, I talked about something. No, things. no, I'm always happy to. I mean, I, I'm happy to run tests. I'll even share the results with my audience. I have no problem with that. Nice. Um, <laughs> l- let me ask you one last question before we, we uh, end the interview. Sure. Uh, and, again, we have to thank U.S. Cell Wellness for getting Bear on the show. Uh, those of you... Uh, who are listening to the show know that I ask you to, uh, you know, uh, patronize sponsors whenever possible. There is a banner ad on the Super Human Radio website on the right hand side for U.S. Cell Wellness. Go there, click it, and check out all of the different uh, supplements they have, especially the two that Bear has talked about: the fumic acid and also the trace minerals. Um, do you get? I know that you've worked with some very, very prestigious organizations, NASA, uh, Walter Reed, uh, so on and so forth. Do you ever get? Um, uh, snickering or eyebrows raised when you start to talk about the things that you learned from your granddad and kind of melding that into what you understand about science today? You know, I, I appreciate that question. I mean, honestly, early on to some degree I did. And, you know, when I was, when I was at NASA, I had hair down the middle of my back and, and still in braids and things like that because I, I, hadn't, I hadn't even cut my hair from you know, for many, many years. I didn't cut my hair until my mother passed away. And so I definitely stood out, you know, to some degree at an officer's club and things like that. But, but on the other hand, um, I would say especially, especially now, f- frankly, and, and I'm, I'm honored by your, your level of interest, because rarely do I do a radio like this with that, in, they're that interested in this. Um, but I would say in these days, I think people are, um, are really interested and, and really open to to, uh, to to understanding, you know, more the native ways. I mean, I can tell you again, without going off too much, I think people have lost um, 
lost confidence in many of the things that we always had confidence in, and they they they're seeing that there's got to be a different way. There's got to be a new way, and maybe the old way or the native way is is the new better way. Um, you know, I, I I would say I see a lot more of that now than I did you know twenty twenty five years ago when I started uh, my my practice or when I started my my training and things like that. Um, you know what's interesting to me? I I have actually lost faith in research. Uh, scientific research, uh, yeah. peer-reviewed research. I used to, that used that was the foundation of my show. When I first started doing my show almost seven years ago, well, now it is seven years ago, yeah. um, I used to have scientists on all the time. Every single show I had scientists on. And I would let them talk about their research. And then I started to realize that the research results quite often was skewed. The endpoints actually yep. cause you uh, to ignore certain things yep. uh, that could have, uh, contraindication to uh, the results that you want. And I also learned that uh, some large percentage of funded research from the NIH never gets published. And the reason it never gets published is because the results is not uh, desired. Uh, what they learned wasn't sympathetic to their cause, and they just don't publish it, which, by the way, that's a waste of taxpayer money, but that's another issue entirely. Correct. And so I started to believe in health history. I started to look at relegating. I started to think to myself, I have a grandfather who lived to be 98 years old who didn't know what his cholesterol levels were. He right. didn't know what his blood pressure was. Right. He ate fa In fact, my grandmother had a jar on the back of the stove where she would gather and save the renderings of the grease that she used to cook right. bacon. And so I, I know that exact thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, and, and I have a great grandparents that all lived at their eighth and ninth decade of life. Uh, I have, uh, uh, I have genetically on, I have longevity, uh, in my genes. Right. Um, these people didn't know anything about, uh, their blood pressure, their cholesterol, LDL, HDL ratios. And in fact, they ate all of the things, uh, that, uh, modern culture tells us we shouldn't eat. Yeah. And they were healthy. They were thriving. My grandfather at 98 years old, the day he was rushed to the hospital, was busy turning his garden. That's what I was going to ask. I bet he was physically active, though, yeah. wasn't he? And actually, yeah. what killed him wow. was the occasional doctor's visit that he did. My father used to brag to me that, you know, my mother's, we're talking about my, my maternal grandfather. She, my, grand, my father used to brag to me that my, my grandfather, Valerio, never had not even a bunion or a corn on his foot. He was always <laughs> so healthy. But the one time he went to the doctor for some, some, for arthritis, they used, you know, everything was arthritis back then. Yeah. The doctor told him that when he had arthritis pain, take an aspirin. Well, he started taking three and four aspirins a day, and he did this methodically, uh, for about a year. Well, lo and behold, he destroyed the lining of his stomach and he bled out because oh, of the man. aspirin. And so, he bled out that day that he went to the hospital. They said uh, that when he when he went to the hospital with his oldest daughter Mary, they came out to, and said, "Look, your husband uh, has a bleeding ulcer. We're going to operate. We're going to." She said, "My husband, that's my father." They said, "Your father? How old is he?" And my aunt Mary said, "98." And the doctor said, "Oh, we can't operate on him because when he heard the number, oh my he, word, yeah, it's God's honest truth." And he ended up dying in the hospital. But the point, the point, the point, the, the point being. Bad. People need to stop listening absolutely to the research du jour and start yeah. listening to their heritage. Absolutely. You know, statistically, we've reduced cholesterol by like 30% United States wide, and people are dying of heart attacks faster and faster. Yeah. So it's, it's just such baloney. Yeah, no, no, no doubt about it. Listen, Bear. Right on. Absolutely true. I would 100% agree. Listen to yourself. Learn and educate yourself. And, and and take care of yourself, you know. Yeah. Listen, I want to invite you back on the show. We'll oh, thank you. We'll thank discuss you some so of the topics to have you back on. Uh, wonderful having you on the show. Thank you so much for being on today, okay? Great, great, my friend. And I look forward to uh, working together with you and happy to come on any time. Okay. Good deal. Again, Thanks, for Barry. your great, great work. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care.